Um, hi everyone, it is a real pleasure to be here today and present to you the contents of the book. Um, uh, I will focus on the book, but <laughs> contrary to what just was said, a big part of the presentation will also be spent on my own research um, and contribution to the book, um, which is uh, Japanese director Sono Sion's 2015 science fiction film The Whispering Star and how it responded to the Fukushima nuclear disaster of March 2011. Okay, um, yeah. So I will start by introducing some general themes and followed by some examples from the book. And I hope this will tease out the multifaceted ways in which artists have responded to the social political conditions of their presence through visions of the apocalypse. Um, imagining the apocalypse. Oh. Imagining the Apocalypse investigates the poly politics of creating images for crisis and the way such disasters are depicted by artists and politicians. Each contribution considers how apocalypticism is not just a neutral description, but a conceptual frame with a narrative structure. Specific, specific to their time and place, visions of Armageddon have often involved organizations of violence. They are usually accompanied by militaristic rhetoric of an in-group under attack from an out-group. This connection with violence may have informed the earliest origins of apocalyptic discourses, which can, trace, which can be traced back to the Middle East's ancient monotheistic religions, or even further back to older Near Eastern and Persian mythologies. Armageddon as a cultural current has always contained a series of conceptual contradictions. It can both be a lived experience and a fantastic projection, and art and visual culture sit at the very interconnection of the two. Artists and image makers have long drawn on eschatology thinking to reveal or challenge deep fears or traumas in their societies. In recent years, climate change is leading to ever more intensified weather conditions and natural disasters. Museums and cultural institutions all over the world too have faced destruction and invaluable losses due to floods, wildfires and environmental contamination. For instance, the floods in Western Germany of, 2000, of 2021, brought on by torrential rainstorms, caused city archives to submerge in water and mud. Another example is how the fallout from the Fukushima nuclear disaster of March 2011 contaminated museums, artworks and cultural assets in the area. Events such as these call into question the boundaries between culture and nature. They also make us aware that we live in calamitous times where the prospect of apocalyptic conditions of our current age of the Anthropocene have become even more palatable. In this context, for instance, Heather Davis and Etienne Turpin have pointed out that the Anthropocene is a sensory phenomenon characterized by the experience of living in an increasingly toxic world. Davis and Turpin highlight the potential of art to address a damaged life world through experimentation and a non-moral non form of address that offers a range of discursive, visual and sensual strategies that are not confined by the regimes of scientific objectivity, political moralism or psychological depression. The current moment of lived precarity thus presents itself as an opportunity to interrogate how artists have confronted conditions of social, political, environmental, economic and personal instability through the subject of the apocalypse, not just in recent times, but also looking back. And in this context, the book's goal is to contribute to the study of art and apocalypses by examining the subject across a variety of historical times, events and artistic genres. While there are people for whom Armageddon is a script for reading reality rather than reality itself, there are also those who have experienced world-ending events throughout history, such for instance indigenous experiences of genocide and settler colonialism. For both perpetrators and survivors, Armageddon seems to offer a way of articulating world-shattering violence. But the end times represent not just annihilation, but also revelation. 
and whether it be the real prospect of ecological disaster or the murderous projections of white supremacists, apocalypticism reveals structures of violence as well as fears and fantasies of power and powerlessness. The word apocalypse, apocalypse derives from Greek meaning unveiling, and the book aims to explore and understand what modern and contemporary images of the end times may tell about the societies that gave rise, rise to them. So to put more context to what I just said, um, I will follow with a few examples from the book. Um, imagining the apocalypse starts out with two contributions that, that consider how artists have invoked apocalyptic imagery to challenge homophobia. Robert Mills examines the practice of British filmmaker, artist and gay rights activist Derek Jarman. Jarman's work responded to the environmental destruction, the potential threat of nuclear war, and the socially conservative government of Margaret Thatcher during the AIDS crisis of the 1980s and 90s. Taking Jarman's film The Last of England as a starting point, Mills considers how the artist's own HIV diagnosis was bound up with collective homophobia and mass death during the pandemic. Andrew Cummings considers the potential for utopian futures in contemporary queer South Korean artist Ju Kim's succulent humans. For many in South Korea, non-conformative non expression of sexuality and gender is seen as a threat to the natural order. Cummings proposes that a prevailing cultural conception of apocalyptic homophobia is rooted in the juxtaposition of the monstrous queer body as open, perose, and connected to non-human existence vis-a-vis -a, -vis a conception of the ideal human body as bounded, discreet, and sovereign. Similar to Jarman's, in Kim's work, homophobia is also conceptualized in connection to ecological crisis, climate change, and environmental collapse. Kim's installation draws on science fiction narratives in which bodies become more than human and as human-plant hybrid to reflect on present conditions and to project them into a post-apocalyptic future. The chapters of Lucy Byford and Toba Oakland Peck um, consider links between end times imagery and violent wars or systems of rule. They highlight how the trope of Armageddon can be used to challenge or entrench structures of power. Byford studies a 1919 action by Dada artist Johannes Bader in Germany's Weimar National Assembly. She considers the artist's employment of millenarian language and imagery, such as that of the horseman of the apocalypse in his handbill. Bader used such concept concepts to critique the government of Germany's new republic as a continuation of imperial ideology in the guise of a new established democracy. Toba Oakland Peck provides further insight into the role of end times imagery in the context of the aftermath of, of the First World War. Oakland Peck examines, for instance, the stage performances of the Defences of London in the 1924 and 25 British Empire exhibition in London. These performances juxtaposed scenes of apocalyptic destruction with successful defense of the British capital against an unknown military force. Combining episodes of imagined and historical Armageddon, these displays reacted to Britain's internal and external destabilization during the period. Growing nationalist movements in the U in UK's colonies challenged the British Empire. At the same time, the experience of the London air raids in World War I and the threat of a class struggle were seen as endangering national security. Oakland Peck shows how the stage displays aimed at boosting nationalism, faith in the government, and sought to promote Britain as an undisputed imperial power. Kate Pickering reflects on Houston's Lakewood megachurch in the US. She maps links between white evangelicalism and therapeutic consumer capitalism centered on the figure of the charismatic entrepreneurial pastor. Lakewood positions itself as a haven for religious seekers. Pickering demonstrates how the audiovisual and meteorological inspired displays 
in the church services serve to create an effective space through which to communicate evangelical apocalypticism and climate skepticism. Arthur Valley studies portrayals of Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro in internet memes, video games, and cartoons that employ apocalyptic iconography. Valley considers how such imagery illustrates entanglements between economic crisis, military state, the COVID pandemic, and far-right politics. He demonstrates that the end of times imagery is used both by Bolsonaro's opponents and followers in criticism or support. They either present him as a horseman of the apocalypse or alternative as a savior figure in the face of queer, feminist, or anti-racist activism. So in the following analysis, I will focus on my own research um, on Sonosion's film, The Whispering Star, and um, highlight as, as, as an example for how visual culture representation of the end times have um, also offered warnings through dystopian visions of the future. More than a decade has passed since the 11th of March 2011, when the Great East Japan earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant struck the northeastern coast of Japan. Despite remaining contaminated and sparsely populated, reconstruction efforts, especially in anticipation of the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, have since returned most of the area to apparent normalcy. However, in the immediate aftermath, the nuclear disaster and its 20-kilometer radius exclusion zone seem to foreshadow a post-apocalyptic vision of the future. Around the nuclear power plant, a toxic ecology without people manifested. The exclusion zone's conditions are on the surface uncannily similar to the post-apocalyptic dystopias of science fiction narratives. They seem to blur the boundaries between reality and fiction. This sense was heightened by a veil of secrecy as the Japanese government attempted to cover up the graveness of the disaster through media censorship and the withholding of information about contamination from the public. With such conditions, the nuclear disaster had an impact on the apocalyptic science fiction um, imaginary, not just in Japan, but also um, abroad. I propose that such narratives can help reveal sociopolitical condi socio conditions of the nuclear disaster and its aftermath. My contribution to the book focuses on the analysis of Sion Sono's science fiction film, The Whispering Star. The film is an adaptation and realization of a script that Sono originally conceived of in, in 1991. The film is almost entirely shot in sepia-tinted monochrome. It takes us to an undefined time in the future. Humanity has been reduced to a, to a handful, and they are silently fading away on the eve of their extinction, brought on by the irredeemable repetition of man-made disasters. The story follows a female android named Suzuki Yoko, who works for an intergalactic delivery service. Yoko, solely accompanied by her childish board computer, 67 Mime, travels from planet to planet um, through the universe. She delivers parcels that contain ominous, seemingly worthless objects to the last remaining humans. Rather than fabricating the landscapes of these planets, the film uniquely, uniquely utilized the real but seemingly post-apocalyptic landscapes in and around the ghost towns of Namie, Futaba, and Okuma, which are located in the Fukushima exclusion zone, as a backdrop to Yoko's voyages. Moreover, the director collaborated with several disaster evacuees who replaced professional actors and embodied the planet's last human residents. According to literary studies scholar Frederick Jameson, science fiction, rather than offering revelations about the future, is especially productive in making us aware of the present. Due to what Jameson identifies as the effects of our period of late capitalism, the present in its immediacy otherwise remains unavailable for us to comprehend. Jameson dates the emergence of late capitalism to the 1950s, concomitant to postmodernism. 
While commonly postmodernity describes the historical, historical period from around the late 1950s to the present, postmodernism is constituted by cultural critique and related to themes in culture such as art, philosophy, literature, and theory. While Jameson explicitly does not engage with the legitimacy of postmodernism itself, he sees late capitalism as pervading the contemporary condition of inevitable, inevitable multinational capitalism, which penetrates both cultural and economic structures. Thus, for him, postmodernism is not referring to a style, but a concept that periodizes, as he identifies popular culture as shaping the collective consciousness of its time. Jameson sees the cultural products of postmodernism as defined by a, list, uh, a loss of historicity, a loss of real sense of past, present, and future, and a replacement of real style with imitations of style or what he terms pastiche. As the postmodern subject is defined by popular culture, without being able to orient itself towards history, it experiences a loss of identity. I argue that with its origins in the 1990s, coinciding with the emergence of Jameson's theory of postmodernism, the whispering star seems to employ some of the features of um, postmodernism. However, um, I also argue that Sono's update of the whispering star as a science fiction narrative to reflect on post-311 Japan, and I use 311 throughout my presentation, but um, 311 is another way to refer to the Fukushima disaster, just to avoid confusion. Um, to reflect on post-311 Japan, translate the film's representations of ahistoricity, pastiche, and loss of identity into a critique and a warning about the post-disaster conditions of Japan. Jameson also draws from science fiction theorist Darko Suvin's concept of cognitive estrangement and explains that science fiction functions not to provide us with visions of the future, but to defamiliarize and restructure our experience of our present. On this basis, I propose that science fiction narratives such as that of Sonos film can with stylistic devices such as cognitive estrangement serve to open up avenues for criticality from which to reflect contemporary social political issues of the post-disaster environment. This leads me to the following questions. How does Sono depict the post-apocalyptic future environment and beings of star? What do these depictions reveal about um, the social, political, and cultural conditions of contemporary Japanese society? And the film is also concomitant of works that Sono conceived of at two moments in time 25 years apart. So therefore, how do these works interrelate, and how, do this how does this connection extend the message and intent of the film? In this context, I mobilize parts of Jameson's postmodern cultural critique to explore how Sono unravels a continuity of the postmodern conditions of a loss of history and identity. In the case of Japan, these conditions originated with the country's defeat in the Second World War. They were then aggravated by the collapse of the post-war economic upturn in the 1980s, which saw, which saw Japanese society enter into decades of economic stagnation. The film begins with a series of scenes in which we see snippets of the film's protagonist, android Suzuki Yoko, performing a simple household activity stretched out over several days. As she's making a cup of tea, she moves through what looks like a domestic living space. However, this soon turns out to be the antiquated interior of a spaceship. Curiously, the spaceship from the outside looks like a, like a traditional Japanese house, complete with a little shrine attached to the back. Only after 10 minutes into the film, these quiet scenes are intercut with some text inserts, unexcitedly informing the viewer of the post-apocalyptic setting in which they have been transported. However, what we learn about this future world is ambiguous. The text on screen informs us that humanity does repeated their substantial disasters and monumental failures, and people died off every time they did. So the film setting seems to be a post-apocalyptic one. The amassing of a multitude of man-made disasters has led to some kind of apocalyptic cataclysm. It is an accumulative apocalypse, graven of ecological collapse, species extinction, global warming, overpopulation, and nuclear wars. The following line of the film's introductory text informs us that space is now ensconced in a quiet peace. 
So the film's post-apocalyptic premise seems to mirror what the socio sociologist Krishan Kumar at the end of the 20th century identified as the slow and uncertain apocalypse of the postmodern period. According to Kumar, the postmodern apocalypse comes not with a bang but a whimper, a version of the apocalypse that dwells obsessively on the end without any expectation of a new beginning. In contrast to the Christian notion of apocalypse as cleansing turnover, Kuma, Kuma's contemporary secular apocalypse comes without hope or sense of the future. Kuma cites the political scientist Francis Fukuyama in noting that humanity will live out its final years quietly in centuries of boredom. Fukuyama wrote at the end of the, of the Cold War. In his book, The End of History and the Last Man from 1992, he prophesied the closure of history, thus mirroring the loss of history warned of by Jameson. While events would still occur, at this moment, Fukuyama saw liberal democracy as establishing itself as ideological monopoly without contestation. And really, nothing much happens in The Whispering Star. The viewer's patience is tested with long static shots of Yoko's surroundings and her ordinary activities. In an all-encompassing renunciation of spectacle, in the Whispering Star's universe is implicit a pervading sense of ennui and emptiness. Just as Jameson, both Kuma and Fukuyama wrote at the end of the 20th century, in the late 1980s and early 90s. While Fukuyama has recently detracted his theory, their writing might be pertinent to how the film's universe is depicted because it's contemporaneous to Sono's development of the film's 555-page storyboard of 1991. Realized 25 years later, The Whispering Star ultimately merges the aftermaths of two destabilizing, arguably apocalyptic moments of Japanese society. This superimposition of two presents reworked as one in the film's universe is underpinned by its function of cognitive estrangement. Daku Suvin identified cognitive estrangement as an integral part of science fiction and defined it as dynamic transformation of the author's environment, which is not only reflecting off, but reflecting on reality. The film's script mirrors the period in which it was first written. The period was dominated by the collapse of unmitigated economic success and security of Japanese post-war society through the burst of the bubble economy and the sense of the emptiness it left behind in the 1990s. As mentioned, Jameson identifies this as the time of postmodernism or late capitalism, a condition of loss of history and thus of individual identity. As the text insert informs us further, in the film's universe, machines control space where robot AI account for 80% and humans account for the other 20%. So while humans are almost extinct, the pursuit of science is all but completed. This is indicative of another moment in time on which the whispering star reflects, the event and aftermath of the nuclear disaster from 2011 to the mid-2010s. This was the time when Sono updated and turned the script into film. It thus highlights the period's realization of the failability of science and technology, as well as the structural weakness of the political system and the social inequality within Japanese society revealed by the disaster. The Whispering Star's post-apocalyptic universe is revealed as deeply dystopian. The utopian vision of progress through nuclear technology is turned on its head and revealed as a nightmare for which humanity has nearly limited itself. Instead of reaping the fruits of scientific advancement and technological engineered immortality, human life expectancy is only a hundred years and humanity's technological forays turned on us. The earth must have been rendered in uninhabitable. Humans are dispersed across the universe silently in an earthly waiting. Without autarky, they are kept alive only by the machines that rule them. In post-war Japan, the American occupation, in association with the Japanese government, worked to reframe the use of nuclear fission as mass destruction and instead propagated it as a way to achieve clean and safe energy needed for economic resurgence. With its post-apocalyptic scenario, the Whispering Star thus reflects on post-disaster reality and its revelation of this energy promise as a myth. 
The film picks, picks up on the fragmentation of Japan's post-disaster society. Those affected by the disaster have lost their communities and are, and are isolated by their stigmatization. They have lost their pre-disaster identities to their perpetual status as victims and evacuees. On the contrary, those who evaded direct effects of the disaster are ready to forget and move on. In the film, machines are in power and androids move freely between planets by spaceship while humans remain immobile and have lost their ability or desire to actively think and pursue knowledge. This mirrors Jameson's characterization of the postmodern subject. However, remarkably absent in the film is an indication of what, what sort of dominant political system machines use to govern this universe, who produces the yokos and who sets up their delivery service. This lack of explanation about a post-apocalyptic form of governance is telling because embedded in it is a suggested failure of the political systems devised by humans. Let us now turn the moment when Yoko enters the, into the Fukushima exclusion zone presented to us in the guise of a foreign planet for the first time. As the spaceship approaches for landing, the iconic silhouettes of Fukushima's tsunami-ravaged landscape come into view through the windows of the spaceship's cockpit. It is dominated by ruins and debris. However, to the viewer, these vistas are familiar as they have become widely known through their dissemination across social media platforms and news outlets. At the same time, the landscape is rendered strange through its representation as the post-apocalyptic environment of another planet in the future. Here, the inherent tension of cognitive estrangement and the success of Star as a science fiction become apparent. Sono himself questions whether his film belongs to the genre of science fiction. For him, it is neither science nor fiction, but rather a film about the past, present, and future. However, as we've seen from Jameson's argument, science fiction too unravels the present. Moreover, with the exception of the presence of an android, science in the film is, as, is at least distinguished by the remarkable absence of scientific advancements. The film also functions according to the parameters of science fiction through its congruence with the inherent tension of cognitive estrangement to defamiliarize us from present reality. There's a dichotomy latent in the concept of cognitive estrangement as to be estranged presupposes a need for a cognitive link felt prior. The setting of the Whispering Stars planets is recognizable as the ravaged ecologies of the Fukushima landscape. However, at the same time, it appears strangely different because it is rendered as a future dystopia. As Yoko walks along a cracked, overgrown road carrying her package towards its recipient, the only audible sound is that of her footsteps and a repetitive metallic clonk. Together with the monochrome of the film, Yoko's entrance in the Fukushima landscape references Andrei Tarkovsky's 1979 science fiction film Stalker. Tarkovsky's film follows three men, a writer, a professor, and their guide named Stalker, as they enter into a post-apocalyptic wasteland, only known as the Zone, to find a room that grants their deepest wish. When the three men are on their way to cross into the Zone, the rhythmic, the rhythmic metallic noise of their railcar's pump handle is the only sound that breaks the silence. Sono also further alludes to Tarkovsky's work in one of the next scenes where we see from inside a half-destroyed building, the camera slowly zooms in onto a window facing the tall weeds of the shore. For a few brief seconds, the whispering star sepia tint turns polychrome. Similar, in Starker, color replaces monochrome when the three men enter the zone. In an eerie foreshadowing of the real-life nuclear exclusion zones to come, Tarkovsky's film addresses environmental deterioration by depicting the zone's ecology as a toxic life world where the laws of man-made science are unhinged. Only Stalker knows how to navigate its invisible danger. In contrast, in his film, Sono misses the opportunity to truly engage with the exclusion zone's toxic radioactive ecology. Instead, he primarily turns it into an allegorical backdrop. In The Whispering Star, as the camera zooms in onto, onto the window, simultaneously with the change to polychrome, a rendition of Marine Ma Marin Marais' baroque suit, Tombeau pour Monsieur de Lully from 1701, 
begins to play in a melancholic B minor. The title Tombeau, which is French for tombstone, marks a musical piece as an ode to honor a real or sometimes fictional person's death. So while the film's olive brown hue before highlighted the antiquated look of its future world and served to establish some distance between the viewer and the reality of the exclusion zone, the sudden burst of color makes the landscape all the more real. As the silence is lifted by the music, for a brief moment nature, now filling the entire screen, is lusciously green and bright blue. The stark realism of the scene all of a sudden firmly anchors us in the present. It highlights what has been lost to the disaster. In a brief, painful moment of nostalgia, Sono allows the viewer to return home. All the more oppressive feels the recall to the monochrome future, and all the more pertinent is the loss of the present. This juxtaposition heightens the viewer's cognitive estrangement from the, the, from the Fukushima landscape as the film continues. Throughout the film, it is slowly revealed what the contents of Yoko's packages are. In one scene, she curiously starts to examine them. As Yoko continues to open and peek inside boxes, seemingly random mundane things become visible. A single pencil, a cigarette stub, or a photograph of a little girl in a white dress. Yoko seems to understand that despite their mundanity, these objects carry great intimacy. They are an expression of value for both sender and recipient. The conglomerate of things carry within them fragments of a past time before the cataclysm catapulted the remaining humans into isolation. The practice of collecting and sharing fragments of the past resembles a similar archiving and preservation practice of many people affected by the 311 disaster. Searching the ruins of their tsunami destroyed or radioactively contaminated homes, victims and evacuees try to salvage the things that once belonged to their loved ones. Collecting the objects that reminded them of a happier past, now lost to the disaster, may represent a form of self-soothing activity. It can be a way to deal with the trauma of the cataclysm. However, to completely engross oneself in memories and to relive the past to such an extent as to be completely numb from the present is arguably dangerous because it may result in passive resignation. After the completion of her first delivery back on board of her spaceship, Yoko starts to tape her thoughts. It is a voice diary for the next person to rent the spaceship. Yoko reminisces in whispers about her delivery service, which feeds on humans' adoration for space and time. The packages she transports from human to human, she ponders, are the only way to convey feelings between sender and recipient. Teleportation was available, but its convenience, the conflation of space and time, led to the deterioration of human feelings. As Yoko is standing in the cockpit and staring into space, she whispers, the last sprite of humanity may be that which comes from the imp impotence of machines. This adoration toward distance and time is probably similar to the pulsing of a heartbeat to a human. In Yoko's universe, human conquests into science and technology are over. However, her monologue suggests that technology advanced slightly before humans completely withdraw from technological progress in exchange for an obsession with emotion, sentimentali sentimentality and nostalgia and the pre preservation of their adoration towards distance and time. <coughs> Conversely, the complete renunciation of order and logic in favor of impulse and emotion runs the danger of the last remaining human's regression into a state of dazed dependency. Similar to the drug Soma, which secures a state of euphoric timelessness of the denizens of writer, writer Alfred Huxley's science fiction dystopia Brave New World, keeping humans in a state of emotive longing, dependent on the supply of memorabilia delivered by machines, ultimately translate in, translates into a form of social control. The trade-off is stark as efficacy, curiosity, and logical thinking are numbed. Scenes of the victims of the disaster as beings of the planets that Yoko visits show them facing away from the camera, immobile and ghost-like. On first impression, Sonne himself seems to equally rejoice in this nostalgia um, as the protagonist of his film and employs tropes similar to what Jameson termed a postmodernist nostalgia art language. 
rather than aiming at a faithful representation of historical content, this mode, according to Jameson, approached the past through stylistic connotation, conveying pastness by the, by glossy, by the glossy qualities of image. Although The Whispering Star does not display quite as glossy images as the nostalgia films that Jameson cites, the conglomerate of anachronistic devices in the spaceship and Yoko's fashion amount to a kind of stock representation of pastness conveyed through stylistic connotation. Upon first view, the spaceship's interior, with its tatami mat floor, time-worn kitchen unit with stove and wooden cupboard, resembles the interior of a small Japanese flat, flat from the later half of the Showa period, which spanned from 1926 to 1989. This past, which includes the post-war period of unmitigated economic success and progress, seems to be the subject of, stars, of the Whispering Star's nostalgic longing. It is a longing that might derive from the current state of post-disaster Japanese society as largely economically stagnant and aging. Equally, the analog technology of the spaceship's cockpit seems to come from the 1950s or 60s. However, upon closer inspection, other elements within the spaceship's interior, such as the 1990s washing machine, reveal themselves as anachronistic. It is a past idealized and distilled from memory, or in Jameson's words, beyond real historical time. In its conglomeration of artifacts and merging of pasts as a science fiction dystopia, but also as historical reference, the Whispering Star's aesthetics seem to represent what Jameson identified as postmodern pastiche. A pastiche is defined by a pasting together of styles and genres without the socially critical element of parody. However, Sono's choice to represent the future as a return to the past could also be understood as containing inherent criticism towards the current state of post-311 Japan. Implicit is perhaps an underlying warning. Governmental control attempts to limit the freedom of expression and the majority of the Japanese complacency about political change may lead to the end of history as warned by Jameson and predicted by Fukuyama. This would translate into a future without significant advancements that can only ever be regressive. Together with the withdrawal from the present into an inner emotive world, confined to the eternal reliving of the past, the Whispering Star's universe portrays political blankness. No information is disclosed about the machines that govern space. Neither Yoko nor her human clients seem to have any political aspirations. The apoliticism that the film depicts that seems to project a dystopian future vision resulting from the publicly accepted post-war image propagated by the Japanese government of society as harmonious and coherent. In post-war Japan, the government retained the official status quo by denouncing and suppressing protest groups and ignoring large-scale protests until they would fizzle out. These same mechanisms could be partly observed post-311. The first few years after the Fukushima disaster saw a brief resurgence of anti-nuclear activism. These protests were especially distinguished for the newly enlarged participation of a younger generation of mothers, students and working singles in their 30s and early 40s. These were people who otherwise did not identify as activists or even as having a political stance. However, since 2015, this demographic largely returned to a state of apparent political disinterest and indifference to exercise, to exercise their rights to vote. Much of this low interest in activism can be attributed to frustration with the seeming ineffectiveness and the invisibility of anti-government political action due to censorship in official media and press outlets. Art critic Savaragi Noi, in his review of The Whispering Star, points out that the film's whisper represents a counterpart to the loud squawk of Sono's 1993 noisy group actions titled Tokyo Gagaga. Ga Ga. These were centered on guerrilla style interventions into public space made up of Sono and others wearing costumes, waving flags, and carrying large banners through the streets of Tokyo's hub of shopping and entertainment Shibuya. They accompanied their march by screams of Tokyo Gaga Ga into several megaphones. 
Arguably for their shocking, nonsensical and outlandish appearance, Sonos group interventions were included in Jean-Jacques Beignet's film Otaku from 1994. The documentary opens with the, record, the record of one of Tokyo Gaga Gas street interventions in 1993. Sono is visible screaming into the megaphone. Where do we take off? What is man's status today? Where is the town of my childhood? What is the point of living through another Sunday without an aim when we are oppressed every other week? Further into the doc documentary, Sono is being interviewed as the leader of the Tokyo Gaga Ga group. He exclaims the group's interventions are a way to find an alternative route for people, a method to reclaim the streets for expression. According to Sono, the city has lost its ability to say something and streets are now being used purely as means to get from A to B. Tokyo Gaga Ga, this was this was deeply political at its core. It is precisely in its nonsensical, non-communicative non expressiveness that it revolted against the shackles of societal pressure to conform to the system. This denial of conformity was a re reaction to a moment of societal turnover due to the loss of stable jobs and lifelong employment concomitant with the burst of the bubble economy at the end of the 1980s and early 90s. Transporting banners with a message such as, from here on there will be no left or right, no upper or lower, Tokyo ga ga ga, the movement seems to be lamenting precisely the postmodern loss of identity of the Japanese in late capitalism, uh, in late capitalism and the hopelessness of its drawn out apocalypse as identified by Jameson and Kuma. Considering the collapse of identity and feelings of precarity in the face of late capitalist society that Sono experienced in the 1990s, the quiet, apolitical whisper in which the whispering star portrays the future comes as a logical counterpart. As Savaragi has pointed out, around the same time that Sono was intervening publicly in the streets of Tokyo, he was sitting alone in his tiny spaceship-like apartment, foreseeing that at some point in the future, a whisper would arrive on this planet. By Tokyo Gagaga -ga -ga was a way to revolt against the feelings of loss and hopelessness, the whispering star contains an underlying critique in that it mirrors Japanese society's lack of pol political alternatives, a resignation to conform to the status quo, and acceptance of a visionless, ahistorical future without any major improvements. The pertinence of the film's vision is exemplified by its easy adaptation and representation of post-311 Japan 25 years later. It projects a continuation of Japan being stuck indefinitely in the postmodern apocalypse, at least from 1991, where the script originated, to today. The tie between Tokyo Gagaga -ga -ga and The Whispering Star was further emphasized when both were exhibited in a small gallery in Tokyo's subculture quarter Koenji, which was also the location of Sono's apartment from 1991. Banners and film documentations of Tokyo Gagaga's -ga -ga's interventions covered the front of the gallery and were displayed inside alongside several screens playing selected scenes from The Whispering Star, which was then unreleased. Juxtaposed to the screaming banners lamenting the postmodern loss of identity, the political void of the film's universe becomes all the more apparent. The Whispering Star presents a future scenario that is deeply dystopian. The film can be considered as a warning for the impending loss of political agency of much of the Japanese pu public post-311, as anti-nuclear and anti-government activism was traded off for superficial social harmony and conformity in favor of succumbing to the pressures to be a diligent citizen. Instead of exercising political agency, the denizens of the Whispering Stars universe are kept trapped in a time lost by memorabilia. Memory is the stuff they feed on, supplied to them by the machines that govern them. However, there's not just one layer to the meaning of the film's theme of memory. While the focus on the reliving of memories instead of acting in the present is a way to ensure political apathy, the film itself also has a political function in keeping the memory about the Fukushima disaster alive. On the film's official website, Sono introduces The Whispering Star by stating that, it, that his intention to make the film was to create a small poem for a weathered memory. In the Japanese original, the term Sono uses for weathered is fuka. 
This term, which equally refers to the erosion of geological materials and the fading of memories, carries political implications, as it was frequently used as part of the post-11 disaster discourse to refer to the fading away of the affected area and the disaster victims from public consciousness. Willful amnesia and a desire to return to business as usual rapidly gripped the Japanese public outside of the disaster-stricken area. It replaced recollections of the disaster with nostalgia for a past already lost. So to conclude with my presentation today, I hope to have highlighted the importance of investigating science fiction narratives to study the contemporary social political dynamics which they reflect in their visions of the future. Based on the coevalness of the genesis of the, the Whispering Star script in the early 1990s, my, analy my analysis drew on Jameson's postmodern cultural critique and the social and cultural char characteristics he recognized within the age of late capitalism. The post-apocalyptic setting of the film depicted the future as postmodern apocalypse, a cumulative, drawn out and without hope for renewal. However, the film's depiction of a future dystopia defined by a nostalgic longing for a past also comes as a warning. The Whispering Star contains an inherent critique towards the treatment of the disaster victims and the upholding of the status quo through the lack of political alternatives. Examining the film in juxtaposition to Sono's artistic interventions of the 1990s in form of Tokyo Ga Ga Ga, a continuity and aggravation of these issues of lack of political alternatives is facing historicity and a loss of identity from the 1990s to past the time of the disaster was made apparent. The dystopian quality of the, of the Whispering Star's vision of the postmodern apocalypse becomes especially pertinent in the way that the film does not fashion a solution to these issues. Instead, it warns that the future for humans might be irredeemably finished if the Japanese people continue to evade political agencies. Sono's inclusion of the real ravaged landscapes of Fukushima and the disaster victims serves to remind audience of their ongoing state of precarity. The film unravels the anxiety about the loss of identity as a real sense of past, present and future is, is, is replaced with nostalgia for an idealist past. The Whispering Star does warns that the present and future that could have been were in inevitably lost to the disaster. Thank you. This concludes my presentation.